Can you hear me now? Very good. Okay, I'm going to ask the Commodore of the CYC and the Commodore of the Royal Prince Alfred to the stage together with um, Colin Carl and Tony O'Donnell from the, from the uh, Marine Rescue and we're going to make the presentation uh, to, from the two clubs. So welcome Commodore Ann and Commodore John. Who's going first? I usually draw a short straw and go last, so then everybody's thanked everybody and I don't have that privilege. But <laughs> thank you all very much for coming. It's a great day to be able to recognise the volunteer services that we have around the, the east coast of New South Wales. It does go all the way around Australia, but it's the east coast of New South Wales, which is important at this time because we're now talking about Port Stephens. The reasons for us being here we won't go into, but what we want to talk about is why these guys do what they do and how they go out and help save our lives. I'm not going to say any more about that at this stage. I'm going to pass it out to Joanne, and I'll chat a bit later about other matters. Uh, thank you, John, and once again, welcome to everyone today. Um, it is great to see you all here, and I'd also particularly like to thank and welcome our friends from Marine Rescue. Um, for those of you who can't remember um, on the days in question, the 5th and 6th of January, um, I was actually um, travelling back from Coffs Harbour in my car on the freeway when I got the call that there was some issues out on the water. There'd been a horrible um, uh, turn of events in terms of the weather. And um, I can tell you, we were on the freeway adjacent to Port Stephens at the time, and it was absolutely horrendous. We were toying with the idea of actually pulling over and um, waiting till um, it, the weather subsided a bit, but we charged on. So, And then when we got back home, we were following from the club here um, your endeavours to um, protect and rescue those boats that were still out there. And I must say, just even following it from afar, it was uh, a fantastic achievement to do what you did. The display of courage and seamanship out there on the water is a great reflection on the Marine Rescue as a service, and also how much heavily we do rely on it as uh, yachtsmen, and as, as all the boating community does on your services, your volunteer services. So. Uh, what we're going to pass over now, we hope will be a small, um, allow you to help in those endeavours. And I think Richard has the relevant checks here. Plus a fancy big one. Okay. So we might come down here to do this. Sorry, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, I forgot to talk into the microphone. Um, firstly, um, on my own behalf, on behalf of uh, my predecessor, Tony O'Donnell, who was, uh, as has been said, unit commander uh, during the relevant period, and Richard Pizzuto, 
uh, who was on the boats. Thank you very much uh, for having us here today and thank you indeed for these presentations. They are greatly appreciated. I might just explain to you that uh, for those who don't uh, perhaps uh, know, uh, the donations that uh, we've received today uh, will go towards the purchase of some very important equipment that will uh, go onto our rescue vessels and it was equipment agreed uh, between the clubs and ourselves uh, with a lot of input from Tony uh, as to what was needed and you may be interested to know that uh, your donation to us uh, today will enable us to purchase the following items of equipment. Firstly, a Rescue Max line thrower, uh, which will enable our crew to deploy a line to a disabled vessel at a distance out to about 100 metres. At the moment, uh, our crew have to do this manually uh, and uh, in the M3 incident in particular uh, this became uh, very important in as much as uh, our vessel, the Daniel Thane, uh, was approaching the M3 uh, but was too far away to manually throw a line uh, to them uh, so they had to go around and make a second pass to come closer to the M3 in order to attempt to get a line to them and it was during that second pass that the incident occurred where our rescue vessel was knocked over and Richard will be talking to you in a bit more detail about that shortly. I make the point that had we had a line thrower on board the Daniel Thane at that time, the whole outcome of the M3 incident may have and in my view would have been very different. So that single piece of equipment makes a big difference to us and that's one of the things we'll be purchasing and we are grateful for that. We will also be purchasing personal locator beacons and a training beacon for our crew. Uh, under our existing uh, policy, all crew, all of our rescue vessel crew are required to wear PLBs uh, and um, uh, attach themselves by lifelines uh, to our boats, particularly when in the open waters environment. Our existing PLBs are just about at the end of their battery life and being somewhat old are not GPS equipped. It became very apparent to us uh, in the post-incident uh, debrief uh, that we always carry out after uh, major incidents uh, that had any of our boat crew, and thankfully they didn't, but had anyone uh, gone overboard at that time. Uh, they had PLBs but uh, not GPS uh, enabled and in, in the particular conditions it would have been very very doubtful uh, if we had been if we would have been able to recover any crew that did go overboard and I stress that they didn't but had they it was very close uh, the outcome again could have been very very different so the PLBs that we will be purchasing uh, being GPS enabled again uh, will make a very big difference uh, to the safety of, uh, of our crew we will also be purchasing um, a set of uh, gill rescue knives. Uh, some of the, uh, the boat crew uh, tell me up back home <coughs> that the purchase of the knives uh, is to ensure that the unit commander doesn't get too far out of line um, and they could think of a use for them, but that's not why we're purchasing them. Uh, as you will hear a bit later on during Richard's presentation, uh, during the, uh, the, the, inc the incident when, the, when our boat got knocked over, a number of our crew became entangled in a number of lines uh, on the rear deck of the Daniel Thane, as you may imagine, uh, in those circumstances, and that became a very, very dangerous situation. Uh, it took a big effort uh, from our crew uh, because some people happened to have their own safety knives, but a lot didn't. Uh, it, it was necessary to cut them free from the entanglement of lines and take them to the safety of inside uh, the cabin on the Daniel Thane. So again, uh, we will be uh, issuing safety knives to all of our crew. May sound uh, like a, a minor uh, piece of equipment, but believe me, as I've said, uh, when the time comes that you need them, you need them, and they have to be on the person. So that's the equipment that we will be uh, uh, purchasing uh, for our rescue vessels with the donations that you've made to us today. And on behalf of uh, myself, Tony, uh, Richard, who's here, uh, my fellow members uh, back at Marine Nuclear Port Stevens, and in particular to our boat crew, we thank you very, very much. Thank you.
One of the reasons why we're involved here is that uh, back in 1998, you'll all remember the Sydney Hobart Yacht Race at that time had some terrible dramas, and out of that grew an institution which we run through the CYC, and it's called the CYCA Solus Trust. The Solus Trust makes donations and has done so since that time, or 1999, a year later, we have donated in excess of a million dollars over that period, and that money is split into three sections. One is to look after any children in a, whose parents were in trouble during a sanctioned YA event, and we did that, and we still are doing it for any people that get into trouble and their children need their schooling. So that's part one. Part two is the donations we make to marine rescue services all around Australia. In fact, we've donated in every state and territory over that period to marine rescue services around Australia. <coughs> we have donated something in the order of $192,000 this year to marine rescue New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria and Tasmania. And these are the things which we as a club and the Solace Trust take very clearly and dearly and look to to maintain the safety of the boating public. And it's the boating public that we're looking for. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to introduce you all to what the CYCA Solace Trust does and why we are in a situation where we are looking after and helping Marine Rescue and all the people involved in that exercise. So thank you all very much. I just wanted to add a few words to that to, to continue on and to let you all know that uh, this is what we look at for looking after sailors around Australia. So thank you all very much. Thanks, John. It's a wonderful organisation we should all support in case we need it and hope we don't. I'm now going to introduce Richard Pizzuto. He's going to give a presentation about the um, marine rescue. Richard is the RAF, RWF Group Captain Day Job at Williamtown Air Base. His marine rescue Port Stephens volunteer, volunteer fun job is the, is the navigator and crew member on board the PS40 rescue lifeboat Daniel Thane, which I think we've seen some photographs of up there during lunch, and he's watch keeper in the radio room communication centre when he's not at sea. His navigating role and the challenging challenges the crew of Daniel Thane faced and survived in the treacherous search and rescue operation and Mayday events as they unfolded off Port Stephens on the 6th and 7th of January uh, were instrumental in the, in the outcome and I think you're going to tell us a bit more about that, Richard, in your presentation. One thing I need to say before the presentation is that uh, due to the Amante matter, being in the hands of police and pending a coronial inquest, the specific circumstances leading to and involving the man overboard incident can't and won't be discussed. So I'll now hand over to Richard. We look forward to an interesting talk. Thank you. Mr. John Cameron, uh, Mr. Ian Orsley, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you all, first of all, for the privilege of being here and uh, giving you an insight into a day in the life of a volunteer lifeboat. Um, maybe not a typical day, but uh, a day nonetheless. I first became an active lifeboat crewman in 1999 when I joined the Port Stephens Division of the Royal Volunteer Coastal Patrol, uh, now amalgamated into Marine Rescue New South Wales. I served on the division's newly acquired lifeboat, Daniel Thane, for almost two years before my Air Force career took me to the UK in July 2001, where I worked for two years as an ATA master controller coordinating the incident and shadowing of Russian long-range aircraft flying through the North Sea. I paid a penance for my overseas sojourn upon returning to Australia in mid-2003 with a posting to Canberra. <laughs> I will spend five of the next six years in Canberra before finally returning to Fort Stevens in mid-2009 by a somewhat circus route which saw me dodging rockets in Afghanistan for five months. 
Upon landing back in Port Stephens, my wife and I were faced with an immense decision of where to buy a house. Her requirements were rational and normal, based as they were around our two young daughters' educational needs, her employment prospects, and of course, lifestyle. My requirements were somewhat simpler, even single might say. I just needed to be within 15 minutes of the Nelson Bay Marina so I could join the boat crew. <laughs> Alas, I carried the day, helped in no small way by a pristine afternoon spent discussing our options over a glass of chilled wine while sitting on Shoal Bay Beach watching the golden light of the setting sun paint a dazzling picture on the port's iconic headland. Not quite sunset, but uh, that's the view. It was only a matter of weeks then before I was back in the Daniel Thane. Over the course of the next six years or so, I trained hard and earned my stripes as a navigator on the lifeboat, racking up a long list of rescues and assists. I've been involved in some of the unit's most dramatic rescues, the Atama, the Crystal Jane, and on a foul night in April 2015, the Reef Dragon. This particular job was horrendous. A large catamaran seeking shelter from the rampaging winds of a vicious east coast low an enormously serene cove, frame cove that is in Herder Bay, driven mooring and all onto rocks by 15 foot waves and cyclonic winds in excess of 78 knots. And this is a picture taken from a vessel in the cove at the time. If you look carefully, you can make out the ghostly image of the catamaran on the rocks. We rescued two men that night from the rocks and were awarded the 2015 National Search and Rescue Award for our efforts. And that was all conducted on board the Daniel Thane. And the Daniel Thane's a bit of a special boat. She's an ex-RNLI boat, so came, comes from the UK Royal National Lifeboat Institute. And she's a purpose-built lifeboat designed by them for the purposes of rescuing people at sea. She's self-writing. She's somewhat slow, but she's self-writing, which makes a good in all sorts of weather. And you can see the specs there. She's not a small boat. She's 52 feet, 32 tonne, with a very modern fit-out of electronics. And she's available on call out of Nelson Bay Marina at about 30 minutes notice, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Operational crew of seven. And if you look down the bottom of this slide, you can see Nelson Bay Marina and Port Stevens towards your tag is, is, is resting there. But more importantly, what this chart shows you is essentially our patrol area. We own the piece of water from Seal Rocks down to Newcastle Harbour, basically. If vessels are getting in trouble in that area, come our responsibility if the police choose to allocate it to us. The weather phenomenon that spawned the horrendous conditions described was described at the time as a one in 100 year event. This is April 2015 I'm talking. Come forward eight months, however, and we were confronted by another similar system. This one was not quite as vicious as the April 2015 version. Combined sea and swell of only 6 to 8 metres by 13 metres and winds of 40 to 50 knots by 75. But it still packed a punch. I'm talking to a few of the guys here today, I understand that some of the yachts were seeing winds of up to 70 knots, which is so different to what I know. The city of Hobart had only just wrapped up when another challenging ocean race takes the stage. The 35th running of the 2000, correction, 226 nautical mile Pitwater to Coffs Harbour Ocean Yacht Race. It draws more than 40 entrants, including a good number of Sydney Hobart veterans. At the end of it all, a handful of yachts head back to Sydney without delay, and we didn't really set in the scene for a dramatic confrontation with an increasingly powerful weather system spinning up in the waters of Port Stephens. M3 Mulberry Racing is the first of many victims. She calls for help when a crewman gets stuck up the mast early on January, the 6th of January. The Northern Bay Water Police respond in their 16 metre launch, Intrepid. But the real hero of this particular story is a deaf young crewman from one of the clipper around the world yachts. Just give me a sec while I try this up. Couldn't get the technology to work properly.
Twitter for anything. a couple of days to catch their breath the clipper race teams were back on the water after taking part in the grueling sydney to hobart australian blue water classic the fleet raced up the derwin to leave tasmania and head north to cross the challenging bass strait for the third time in as many weeks this is the sixth in the clipper race series and the final stage of the australia leg for henry lloyd hobart to win sunday's race <coughs> Today's events weren't without incident though. The mission performance team put their race on hold to go to the assistance of another yacht, not part of the Clipper race fleet, who was in distress nearby after a crew member became trapped at the top of the mast. 27-year-old Gavin Reed from Surrey volunteered to transfer to the other yacht and climb the mast to help. Gavin, who's deaf from birth and wears special waterproof hearing aids, can be seen here ascending the mast as the casualties trapped in the rigging at the top was, however, eventually able to help the stranded crewman down. I'm glad my hearing aids are fine. So when I got on the mast, uh, the halyards were wrapped all around the mast at the top, so I was required to go up and try and help. Uh, so I had to land myself and put myself down. It was pretty bumpy, uh, and I got up there for quite a while. I got up there for about nine hours, so I'm glad, I'm glad he's down now. Mask climbing skills developed as a sailor, Gavin was able to then get himself safely back down to the applause of his teammates. The rescue has put mission performance at the back of the fleet, but they've applied for redress from the Clipper Race Committee. With less than 700 miles left to the finish line at Airlie Beach on the northeast Queensland coast, crews are looking forward to some well-earned rest in the picturesque Whit Sundays next week before starting their Asia-Pacific leg to Vietnam and China. <laughs> Intrepid's only just returned to her birth, and you saw her at the end of that video pick the large 600 meter police launch. That's Intrepid. She only returned to her birth in the morning when at 11.08 a mayday call from out of sight pierces the silence. This call is an instant response from Maritime One, which is already on the water, and now races for the heads. The police launch Intrepid departs the marina not long after Maritime, after. Maritime One reaches the heads and is confronted with a daunting sight. 46 metre breaking waves guard the northern side. And whilst the south side is not quite as rough, the washing machine just beyond is firing. Given life by the interactions of wind and swell with the rocky bastions that are the heads and the offshore islands. The churning mass of water demands your utmost respect. It can be quite exhilarating when the swells up a little, but it's best avoided when the swells up a lot. Maritime One, on seeing the conditions beyond the heads, makes this decision. The much bigger intrepid soon departs the heads and proceeds north to intercept out of sight. Meanwhile, a memorial service is underway up at the Marine Rescue Radio Base, the late Peter Fisher, a long-serving member of the lifeboat crew. Peter's ashes are due to be scattered 
from the lifeboat in the early afternoon and the small room is packed with Peter's family and friends, including a good number of active boat crew. The unit's administration officer quietly enters the room and discreetly motions for the boat crew to take their leave. Port Stevens 4-0 has been placed on standby by, by Marine Area Command and the crew from the service makes the short journey to the lifeboat berth and quickly go about preparing themselves and the boat for sea. As this is happening, 15 miles away, a tragic sequence of events begins to unfold northeast of Broad Island. The late Mal Lennon is at the helm of the yacht Amante when he is swept overboard by a large wave. making her way to the heads when the MOB alarm is raised and she's quickly tasked to proceed to the scene. Meanwhile, the police launch intrepid is taken out of sight in tow and is proceeding back to the port. Another yacht, Jem, on hearing the relayed mayday call for Amante's man overboard, abandons her planes and joins the search for Mr. Lennon. As the search gathers momentum, this decision is made to transfer the tow of out of sight from the police launch to Daniel Thane thus freeing the fast intrepid to proceed to the scene. And you can see the view out of the uh, wheelhouse windows of the Daniel Thane. And the tow set and ready to uh, dispatch to uh, out of sight. The tow is successfully transferred and Daniel Thane proceeds slowly back to port with out of sight in tow. Just over one hour later, at about 2 p.m., out of sight is safely moored just outside Nelson Bay Marina, and the Daniel Thane is again on standby, back at her berth. As the crew await further instructions, the unit administration officer suddenly appears at the berth with fresh, dry clothes for all. A local fish shop, having watched the day's proceedings, also to do this complimentary coffee and fish and chips to the uh, lifeboat crew. Most of that made a weird translator that day. <laughs> <laughs> the search for Mr. Lennon is now in full swing, with Intrepid, Amante, Jem and two rescue helicopters scouring the seas. The Daniel Thane is soon tasked to join the search and gets back underway in minutes. Jem, meanwhile, having gallantly assisted in the search for three hours, finally succumbs to the atrocious conditions and now also makes a call for help. The helms went to the point of collapse and they are unable to maintain course. Daniel Thane fights her way north in worsening conditions, now tasked with the job of towing Amante back into the port. This is a video taken out of the uh, wheelhouse windows on Daniel Thane as she heads north. It's around this time that M3 now makes a second call for assistance, having failed her rigging and lost her engine. She's south of the port entrance but being blown back up the coast at a sprightly three to four knots. Unfortunately, the area's marine rescue resources, both police and marine rescue New South Wales, are fully committed 
and the five people on board in three will have to ride out the conditions as best they can until such time as the rescue can be effected. The Port Stevens base, meanwhile, continues to monitor their situation very closely. The Daniel Thane reaches a Monte at about 6 p.m. The conditions, however, are assessed as too dangerous to set a tow, and a Monte is instead escorted by the lifeboat away from the search area and back to the port. The situation at this time overall looks something like this. We've got a Mante under escort with the Daniel Thane just uh, to the east of Broughton Island. Uh, Jen and the police boat Intrepid to the north still involved in the search and there are two choppers in there at this time as well. And you can just see M3 in the bottom right of the picture just starting to make their way to the north, north, east adrift. With no insight to the dramas, Marine Rescue Port Stevens now also activates a second crew to be ready to take Daniel Thane back out once she delivers a Mante into the marina. As she approaches her berth ahead of a Mante, the second crew is there to assist with the berthing. The sight of the Daniel Thane escorting a Mante into Nelson Bay Marina just before 8pm is indeed a sad one to behold. The Daniel Thane has now been retasked by Marine Area Command to go to the aid of M3. The engines are left running as the off-going crew take their leave, having spent much of the last nine hours battling atrocious seas. They can now rest, but the Daniel Thane will not. She departs her berth at 8.22pm on a fateful mission to rescue M3 with a fresh crew of seven. Position reports at the time place M3 almost directly east of the port, at 15 miles from the port entrance, and drifting at three to four knots in a very heavy five to six metre southeasterly swell topped with a very confused and breaking two metre sea. The skipper and navigator confer and a course is set for a departure through the northern side of the heads with a route planned out through the islands and then on a heading of 040 degrees magnetic to intercept M3. As soon as we round Nelson Head, however, we get a clear view of the conditions at the heads. The eight metre breaking waves guarding that side of the port were paid for this plan and a southern departure is quickly reworked. The revised route will take us to the east, south of Bundaberg Island, and then north in pursuit of M3. This route is not ideal, putting us in a tail chase, but it does take uh, more, more so than a direct cutoff. But such a cutoff route was simply not possible or safe in the conditions. Even on an easterly heading, looking to pass south of Bundaberg, we experienced some of, if not the worst conditions I can ever recall in the washing machine. The boat was slammed by random crossfalls and the skipper tried valiantly to hold his he her head within 30 degrees of the desired heading. Progress was pitifully slow, as the lifeboat expended more energy going up, down and sideways than she did going forward. When she did go forward, it was typically off the top of a six metre wave into a deep trough. It's two miles from the heads to the point south of Bundaberg Island, a distance you'd expect to cover in about 15 minutes. On this night, it took us almost an hour. As the lifeboat struggled to make way on an easterly course to clear the heads, correction, clear the islands, the sleek hull of M3 slipped further northwest, propelled by the monstrous seas and wind. Even on the more northerly heading, we struggled to close on the yacht. The lifeboat could bake barely six knots in the conditions, compared to the M3's drift away from us of about three knots. With 10 miles separating two vessels and a closing speed of barely three knots, the math is obvious. It was shaping up as a long and demanding chase. As we fought our way towards Broughton, we passed in traffic with Jen in tow. The police launch had gone to their assistance after the search for Mr. Lennon had been suspended for the night due to the dangerous conditions. Even the two rescue helicopters had been grounded by the worsening weather. We established good comms with M3 on channel 16 and discussed our plans for securing the tow.
Yes. Uh, we'll talk to you about uh, the tow once we get in a little bit closer over. Roger that. Um, we're looking for a tow gear if you've got on board, over. Sorry, just call the last bit. Say again, over. calculations and the alarming reality came sharply into focus. At no more than six knots the lifeboat would not reach M3 before she would lay out ground on the eastern shore of the wide arc of beach several miles to the south of the Seal Rocks lighthouse. M3 was rapidly drifting to her doom. This alarming conclusion was relayed to the Watt radio base who then informed the man. I had the unpleasant task of telling M3. Closer and closer to the coast, she was instructed by the police to activate an e bird. including deployment of a sea grove and the laying of sails overboard. In a last ditch effort to buy more time for the lifeboat to get to her, M3 was now instructed to jury rig a sail and endeavour to make her way east. This she managed with considerable difficulty in the huge seas, and her drift towards the beach was halted and then reversed. We had now closed within two miles of M3 and could see her lights intermittently as both vessels rose and fell in a huge swell. Yeah, we're going to take again now. Uh, we're actually 
Having arrested her drift, M3 was now confronted by a new dilemma, a distinct lack of sea room. She drifted into an area bounded by heavy shoaling and a very active set of Lomboras to her east and north, and therefore could not maintain her preferred easterly course. A tack and a drive followed, but the navigator's radar picture and more urgent requests for assistance from M3 told the real story. M3 was rapidly running out of time, and every wave conspired to drive her into shallower water, closer to the beach, making the lifeboat's job even more difficult. set on the back deck, but the skipper now ordered a nose tow to be set, given the lack of sea room he had. At this point in time, the seven crew of the Daniel Thane were positioned as follows. Ron, the skipper, was on the flybridge at the helm. I was beside him as a safety watch and to operate the forward searchlight. Mike, the engineer, was eight feet from me on the top rail, manning the aft searchlight. And Laurie, Paul, Tom and Ian were on the aft deck, ready to set the tow. The situation was urgent and the margins were narrowed but things were under control. And then in one half moment it all changed. Be rescued, be rescued, this is M3, M3. Drifted into the breakers hammering the Agon Beach with the crew abandoning ship, the Daniel Thane became involved in her own struggle for survival. This is actually a plot uh, of the uh, nav trace from the Daniel Thane's on board GPS system. It starts at point three, obviously. I've got a close up coming up which will show you, I'll tell you where we got knocked down, the three knockdowns. But you can see essentially the, uh, the rush towards the beach, which wasn't of our choosing. A massive roar was the first hint of impending mayhem as Ron and I both looked with horror at a churning wall of white water at least twice the height of the lifeboat, charging out of the darkness on our starboard side. It pummeled into the side of the lifeboat with ungodly force and quite literally knocked the 32 ton lifeboat flat. It then drove the vessel towards the beach. The fire bridge was in the water, the port side rail and well submerged, and every crew member just held on for whatever they could. All crew minus one were wearing lifelines, and there is no doubt that these lifelines stopped three of the four crewmen on the aft deck from being lost overboard. The fourth man on the aft deck had chosen precisely the wrong time to position, reposition his lifeline to a new anchor point. He had just unclipped and swept over the back railing by a ton of white water. In desperation, he grabbed onto the railing and quite literally held on for his life. Uh, I know from the first hand accounts from the guys that three of them actually went over the railing. Uh, two of them were stopped by the lifelines and hung off the railing. And the third guy was this, this poor guy who uh, held on to the railing. It took some effort to get him off the railing, he wouldn't let go. 
Up on the Pye Bridge, Ron and I both got knocked off our feet and were submerged under a swirling mass of white water. As soon as the waves subsided, the faithful old lifeboat righted herself. We were now fighting to save our boat and ourselves. We had been onto the sea in about six metres of water and without a port engine. It had stopped when we rolled. And all around us were the sights and sounds of eight metre breaking waves. Ron struggled to his feet and desperately tried to turn the boat to starboard. His task made all the more difficult by the loss of the port engine. I was back alongside him watching an that rapidly approaching wall of water towering over the lifeboat with a mix of fascination and fear. This next monster wasn't much smaller than the first and it too shamed in the lifeboat starboard side, knocking us down a second time but only to 90 degrees. The third knockdown was almost routine by now, but thankfully it was also our last. Ryan had succeeded in getting the bow around to seaward and the Daniel Thane charged abundantly at the line of breakers. Abundantly, but somewhat slowly. The port engine was still out and the ship's alarms were ringing warnings of an overheating starboard engine as well. Faced with the possibility of the loss of the starboard engine if we maintained the revs versus the certainty of us ending up on the beach, we didn't. Ron chose to ignore the alarms. The base meanwhile would be making increasingly urgent calls for Port Stevens 4-0, which had now been silent for more than four minutes. Eventually, Mike, the engineer, grabs the radio mic as he struggles to restart the port engine and gives the base its first confirmation that 4-0 is indeed in trouble. Before I play the con, that's the actual close-up of the, uh, the motions of the boat, uh, essentially when it's in the surf. The first knockdown occurs at point seven, in the bottom of the picture there, and you can see we get driven back from about 14 metres to about 10 metres in depth. There's a whole lot of movement there as the boats roll and, and uprights and goes back a bit further and whatever else. The second knockdown occurs at point 18, and you can see we get shunted back further again. We right, go backwards, and then we get hit again and driven back another, that's probably about 50 metres. So uh, we a little depiction of the, uh, the motions. All that movement towards the beach was unintended. Once we get under control, you can see at point 23, we then start to make our way back out. At this point, Laurie, who's on the back deck, yells up to the flybridge that all deck crew are now accounted for. What he doesn't convey is that he had to sever their lifelines with his knife to free them from the tangled mess of the aft deck and then physically manhandle them back into the main cabin for their safety. Laurie and I swapped out so that I could get back on the nav desk and guide the boat to safer water. The aft deck was abandoned, but just inside the main cabin, Ian, Tom and Paul were slumped on the floor and in a chair. One had a dislocated shoulder, another a lacerated eye, and all three had clearly been through the ringer. I quickly assessed the boat's position and gave a safe head in once clear of the breakers. Quite simply, I told Ron to put the shore boat point lighthouse in his 8 o'clock position to keep it there. Then I got on the radio. Uh, so much so that I couldn't remember the name of the vessel we'd been chasing up the coast for the last four hours. My next priority was to tend to the injured crew. As I moved amongst them, a new threat suddenly dawned on me. The aft deck was a, me a mess, but there was something missing, about 30 metres worth of tow line. I ran to the stern rail and was confronted by an unnerving sight. 
a swirling mass of line in the water and only feet from the start of the propeller. It was this line, if this line became entangled around that prop, we'd lose the single engine we had that was keeping us off the beach and it would all be over. I yelled for assistance from the deck crew laying inside the main cabin and Tom, the youngest member of the crew at 18 years old, with a bloody brow and all responded. We worked desperately on our hands and knees to recover the tow line, heaving my own bridle. Not an easy task if the boat pitched violently in an eight metre breaking seas. We eventually succeeded, however, and I for one breathed a heavy sigh of relief. Michael, meanwhile, had succeeded in restating the port engine, while Sean and Laurie nursed the battered and bruised lifeboat towards home. All on the wise regarding the dramas on the aft deck. <coughs> the five people on M3 had made it safely to the beach and were met there by police soon after. Police out of Foster, main police. This was welcome news for the lifeboat crew, who now faced a four hour trip home through dark and foreboding seas. The radio base and the NAC operators could now sense the seriousness of the situation and set wheels in motion to shepherd the lifeboat home. The Westpac helicopter was tasked to shepherd the lifeboat but was grounded by the weather. Nonetheless, it remained on alert to assist the lifeboat. Nelson Bay Water Police also responded and met with them with them just north of Broughton Island in the Intrepid. That's quite an amazing story. They had just gotten them back alongside in the marina. They refueled, changed crews and came straight back out again. Pretty much uh, they've been on the water almost for 24 hours at this stage. They were indeed a sight for sore eyes, and I can tell you that from, uh, from personal experience. When we looked at the back and saw the police vessel there, that was, uh, that was rather comforting. The trip home was long and contemplated. The lifeboat finally entered its home port at 5.30, just as the sun rose and some nine hours after we departed. Before I move on, I just want to uh, mention the guys you see in this photo here. One of them is sitting there right now, and he's the unit commander now. So he got promoted for the job he did on this day. Um, that's Colin in the middle, obviously. The guy standing up is Neil Greaves, our regional controller. He looks after the mid North Coast region. Uh, and he uh, got a phone call that we were in trouble not long after, uh, about quarter to one. Promptly jumped in his car and drove about two hours to the radio base to, uh, to, to keep watch and to assist. And the guy in the bottom of the, the, the uh, picture, he's the guy you hear a lot on the radio, that's Mike Graver, one of our radio, one of the watch keepers. <coughs> and actually an ex-policeman. Uh, with lots of good experience, I don't think that showed on the day. Uh, the only other guy missing from there is uh, Tony O'Donnell. He was the fourth in that team, basically. Uh, he'd been on for most of the day, and him and Colin had worked a rostering system. So he'd, uh, well, Colin had to eat his dinner. Um, he'd come back up and release Tony. Tony had been going home, probably to get some sleep. Uh, they got a call at what time, Tony? About one o'clock? And uh, finally came back in. The call, I don't know, what did the call say? Daniel Fane has just rolled. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> probably not the thing that a unit commander wants to hear about is his uh, big, big city with the lifeboat. But uh, these guys did an amazing job, and uh, you know, the boat crew were indebted to them. We've, we've made that clear to them in the past. But uh, what you don't see and what I didn't play was probably the 25 position reports I was, they kept asking me for. Um, I thought that was a bit over the top since we had AOS and it was still working on it. But uh, I think his motive was, was somewhat ulterior. Make sure you're awake. <laughs> <laughs> That's a photo that uh, Tony took as a uh, 3 sorry, 4 comes back in in the morning. 
We've actually tidied the ship up a bit by this stage. Uh, if you'd have seen her after the roll, you can see the, uh, the V-shaped uh, hoist on the back end of the superstructure. They both self-deployed, so we looked like a trawler for a while there. They both deployed. Um, the inside is still a Chinese laundry. Um, there's maps, charts, bones, anything that wasn't bolted down is on the floor. Um, and Fish and chips. And, <laughs> yeah, from the previous crew, mind you. <laughs> we haven't had a chance to hose the boat down. Um, other things that happen too, we have a 15-foot uh, boat hook that lives on this side of the lifeboat. It's now missing, as it will be actually find eventually. It was on the boat, just not really expected. It's broken in half. And we had another boat hook on the other side, which uh, is somewhere up in the Seal Rock River. So if you're up that way and you're trolling around, you find one, we wouldn't mind it back. <laughs> At the birth, the unit commander, Tony, and Neil Greaves welcomed us. These two men were soon joined by a team of ambulance paramedics who wasted no time in tending to the injured crew and by the two policemen who braved the traffic conditions and stepped with the lifeboat home. Uh, and the response was quite outstanding to us, but uh, definitely showed, uh, showed that, uh, what people thought. Uh, we had three ambulances arrived and we were sworn by we had one paramedic to each crew member basically and a team of doctors on standby as well. And the water police literally were over there in a flash. As the sun rose on the 7th of January, the early morning light illuminated evidence of the, fine, the dramas of the past 24 hours. Uh, that's the crew of 4-0 uh, uh, taken literally as the boat's berthed and uh, Tony couldn't help himself, he had to get a photo of posterity. Uh, I'll play a little quiz here. Can you find the guy with the dislocated shoulder? Just look at the faces. The guy second from right. Okay, he's in a lot of pain, he's a stoic. I was going to say, I won't call him that, but he's a, he's a stoic bloke. But he, his arm was dislocated, his uh, left arm was shoulder was dislocated. It slipped back in not long after, but subsequently it turns out he's done some fair range damage to ligaments and tendons and everything else. He's still in a sling and after uh, some surgery as well. You can see uh, the other faces of some happy guys. This is the morning after. Um, this is a great photo, it shows two versions of the uh, M3, the sailing version and the, uh, the, the life-saving version. Um, personally, I think if these guys hadn't used their life raft, having seen what was happening on the beach, uh, eight metre breaking waves hitting the beach and bouncing back, it's not the sort of environment I think a, a man in the water could have survived, even with a life jacket on. So their decision to get into their life raft, even though it was only about a 20 metre trip, what the difference between life and death of various dogs. Um, and one very nice TB-52 sitting on the beach in a rather awkward position. This photo was taken at the Nelson Bay Marina. Um, four zeros back alongside of Earth in the far, far right of the picture. That's uh, the vessel gem tied up alongside the police boat. You can see the police boat intrepid on the other side of it. Uh, Sarah's here from gem and she now tells me that uh, that boat suffered quite significant damage. Uh, we didn't realise at the time that she'd been pooped and she was carrying uh, quite a lot of water and she was flying aboard into the boat. A small side note, um, I didn't realise this, but I got a, an email from a guy who I'd shared a house with many years ago um, when he saw my article in Boat Point. He, you know, my name's fairly distinctive and he questioned me on whether I was deliberately with Jeff Dustin, blah, blah, blah. blah. Turns out I actually did live in a house with the now owner of Jim many years ago when he was in the Air Force. Not what I'd like to see. When I saw that photo on the uh, on the right there, I understood why we had such a hard time catching this boat. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a sleek uh, competition machine. That's the morning after. Um, you can still see the remnants of the weather in the background still. And the surf's still a little bit messy. Uh, they did actually recover the M3. Um, she'd been had a shape slightly altered there. And they then towed her away and uh, 
for uh, repairs and assessment and repairs. One of the, uh, we don't get paid, that's, that's been, that point's been made before. Um, our payments in handshakes and, and smiles and the look in people's eyes and we look in their eyes and we see um, their thanks. On the, uh, on our debrief, during our debrief session about, I think, two days or maybe a day after this, uh, unbeknownst to us, and, and I don't know who didn't, I think Tony was maybe the only guy who knew, but these are three members of the M3 crew, three of the five, the other two were, were not well enough to travel. Um, the skipper in the middle there shaking hands with our skipper. Uh, and it's only when we talked to these guys we actually realised what had happened to us in, in full because uh, Mike, the guy in the middle, the skipper, he was on the bow, he, he was the guy on the radio most of the time talking to me on M3. But he'd handed the radio over to the Singaporean crew member and gone up to the bow to receive our throw. Uh, and as they washed into the break, uh, the last thing he saw was our life getting hit by that massive wave. And he's the guy that tells us, you know, we, we, no one on the board of that knew what actually happened in terms of how they rolled, but he tells a story about how you know, he, he thought we were gone. Um, he saw the lifeboat roll, he reckons about 130 degrees, keel out of the keel up, he saw the keel quite clearly, the lights went out, and uh, he thought it was it for us, and, to be honest, so did we. But uh, yeah, really nice surprise to see these guys come around and uh, thank us personally and uh, to be able to swap stories. And they had some good stories to tell too, so if you ever managed to walk into these guys, ask them for their version of events too, quite spectacular. And that, ladies and gents, is an atypical day in the life of the project. <laughs>